Hello and welcome to Academy of Tone 148. <clears throat> the tone is in the cone. Uh, we have tons of cones, which are speakers just behind me. And um, I want to have a little insight into what's the difference with different speakers and cabinets. As we have today a a different situation from like 20 years ago, from like 40 or 50 years ago, when the whole electric guitar was um, kind of designed and the amplifiers were designed. The scenario on today's um, stages has changed and I think has changed dramatically, at least for certain um, styles of music and bands. And of course, everybody is moaning, you are too loud. <clears throat> Therefore, me personally have um, reduced my gear to a single 1x12 cabinet on, well, um, on stage and I'm playing like 99% of all my gigs with that fat cap. Um, and I'm coming from the good old stacks. I used to have a full stack. Now, it's actually this table here. This is... <laughs> The bottom cabinet of my, um, this is a good old Marshall um, cabinet here. Um, as we can see, this is for the casters here. And <clears throat> the good old greenish Tolex, which says it's a, an old one from like the 70s or even earlier. This one is kind of 69, I think. Okay, um, but before we dive into the speakers, the cones, and all of this topic, I have to tell you today is Women's Day. And finally, we see more and more female guitar players in bands. Um, from our side, we have a, a, a few kind of celebrity users in the blue guitar um, world. Of course, Miss Jennifer Batten. There will be a nice interview with Jennifer um, in a few minutes, but also Kat Dyson. Um, well, Jennifer Batten, everybody knows she was playing with Michael Jackson and Jeff Beck. So we talk about all that and more. Um, <clears throat> Kat Dyson is currently on tour with Zuko, but she was in Prince's band. So Jackson and Prince, ladies playing M1 now. Um, Mariana Rosa, um, Tammy Lacey, Mercedes Alfonso and Laura are a few of the younger females in the Blue Guitar team. Um, I think we should watch that video that I recorded, I think yesterday with Jennifer on a lot of topics, of course, um, about the Women's Day as a starting point, and then we drifted somewhere where it's, it's kind of a thing that um, I know Jennifer for many years now, and we actually play together, um, and I, um, I have a, first, I have high respect for her, and secondly, um, she is doing exceptional stuff, not only the two-hand tapping things, but also what she picked up from Jeff Beck and, and so on. Hey, just watch that interview. Exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go again. Miss Jennifer Batten. Today is Women's Day. So, you know, I was thinking about Women's Day. Who do I know who's actually female besides my girlfriend? And no, Jennifer Batten comes to mind being one of the most easy to work with female in my whole entire life. I know more male bitchy singers. And Jennifer, <laughs> I have to be honest, you are a pleasure to work with. We've been on tour together and it, everything is so easy. You understand everything. You've been there. You sent the postcard. Uh, you, and, you know, everything was so smooth. I'm just, you know, it, it's so great to work with you. That's here. It needs to be said. So. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I, I like things to be smooth. You know, it's, it's, it's very rare that I will go off and get pissed off about something. I give people a long rope 
before I snap. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I really can appreciate that because I know that you get all the information, you process the information and before you open your mouth and tell something, there's a lot of thoughts coming in there. I can feel that and I appreciate that a lot, you know, because I made the experience with a lot of singers and sometimes female singers, they have all, uh, too many problems on the road. And I guess you, you can smell that too. And so you are the easiest one I've ever worked with. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, especially on the road, there's, there's, there's going to be challenges. What, <clears throat> nothing ever goes to plan and you just got to roll with it. So if you're going to be yeah. on the road, you, you, you got to deal with that. Yeah. So there you go. And there you go. Yeah. Jennifer is a total pro when, when it comes to that. And talking about the Women's Day, okay, there are some female guitar players in this world who made it. You are one of them. But I, I think you, we, we know some other uh, female guitar players. Um, some, some of them might even be your friends. Uh, Kat Dyson or comes to mind. Uh, Oh God, there, there's so many now, so many badasses. Neely Brosh, Nita Strauss. Ah, Neely, yeah. I'm gonna see uh, the band Covet with Yvette, Yvette Young has a, a really unique okay. style. And Laurie Basilio is killing it. Uh, she's okay. one, of, one of my favorites. I mean, she, she's just such a fine musician. It's, yeah. it's great. Yeah. So when you look at, at the history of female guitar players, I, I've seen videos of some Older blues ladies, I forgot the name, sorry, in the internet. Are you, uh, Ma, what, what's her name? Sister Rosetta Tharp is one. I mean, you know, to me, that's, you know, bam, mean blues, strong lady, impressive. You know, I didn't know about that, but, you know, when you look up female guitar players, she comes up and it's like, man, you know, she's got something to say. I was impressed. You know, I used to use a video of her to open up my solo multimedia show. <clears throat> There's a great video of her doing Up Above My Head. And it right. starts with the camera just on the guitar, so you don't realize it's female until it gets into the song. And then, you know, mind blown. Yeah. Especially back then. I Gosh, 30s, 40s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long time ago. Uh, so, so for me, it's it's good to see more female guitar players because, you know, it's... The stinky, <laughs> you know, male ego. It, it was a very dominated uh, uh, genre, you know, having all these male egos on stage and, <laughs> you know, um, which is part of the game. But on the other hand, I think um, it's great to see the variety and also seeing females doing it, you know, mean in a way. Yeah, Nita Strauss has that. She she yeah. has that that whole rock and roll head flippy thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough hair to flip my head. Plus, my neck isn't in such great shape anymore. <laughs> but yeah, she she gets up there and owns it for sure. Times have changed, yeah. man. When I when I was in Michael Jackson's band, I thought, okay, now the female revolution has begun because Wendy and Lisa were already with Prince, and then there was All various right, yeah. women on MTV. And then crickets, you know, there's not a lot yeah. that happened for 10, 15 years. I, th I think until YouTube started, <clears throat> people started having high speed and more powerful computers. Then they could start to see each other. There's more videos being uploaded. And I often tell people there's, there's not a, a month that goes by that somebody doesn't turn me on to some seven-year-old in Indonesia that can <laughs> kick my ass. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, I think um, it, it's great to see all these people from all over the, uh, the world. But I think there is still another level of the guys and girls who really make it, make it on stage and perform in front of an audience. That's for me, uh, th there's the internet world, which is fine. And it's great to have that world. But I'm old school. When I play a gig, you know, and and you are sweating on stage, and the audience is cheering up, and and you can feel the energy of human beings being in a room and sharing the moment of that concert, that's still a ceremony beyond yeah, yeah. the internet. The internet. 
Yeah, it's community. So, that that's I think yeah. that's what we all long for, and I feel bad for the people that are only online because it can be really scary to be face to face with an audience staring you in the eyes, and it it takes time to get used to that. You know, it's yeah. it, years. Yeah. On the other hand, it's even more pleasure for me but because when I'm sure. in front of the audience and the and you get the connection to the audience and you get the energy back because they kind of feel you and I feel them and it's in sync, that's, that's the most beautiful thing ever. And on the internet, you don't know. I mean, maybe you have millions of clicks, everybody says it's nice, but you don't, do you really feel the number? <laughs> I don't feel numbers. <laughs> it's, it just cannot be compared. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Hey, um, you have been on the She Awards once or twice or how many times? Um, what, what are the She Awards? What is this? Uh, the She Rocks Awards is something that started it at least 10 years ago by a woman named Laura Whitmore. And mm -hmm. she is a go getter. She is a force to be reckoned with. She has a marketing company, which really helps get the word out. But she just wanted to recognize women in the industry, not just players, but women behind the scenes, um, designers of gear, CEOs of companies. And every year she has an award ceremony at the NAMM show. And um, I, I think, gosh, I, I can't remember which number I was in. Um, But I had heard that when they started out, it was tiny. So by the time I got there, it was a giant ballroom at the at the NAMM show that was just filled with people. And it, it was a big deal. You know, the people yeah. play and um, just just to get to honor other women that are that are kicking ass was a, a really fun thing to experience. Yeah, absolutely. I think. Uh, <clears throat> making this kind of events is important and uh, for me organizations like the NAM hopefully the NAM will still do do its job because also NAM is shrinking you know I'm I, I'm gonna be at the when is it April NAM this year and nobody really goes there because it's April you know the Europeans don't escape the winter anymore because in April we get <laughs> springtime here so why go uh, in January you know we have freezing temperatures so uh, California is a good good escape for us and a good excuse to say bye bye to the family for a week and have a few sunny days in sunny California for at least a week at NAMM show which will be in January next year again, 24. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't and sure why they moved that. I can tell you, they have been not fast enough. Some other industries have been snapping those uh, dates, the good dates in January. Okay. Okay, blame on NAM, but I'm a mem member, I pay for them. <laughs> What can I say? Anyway, um, <clears throat> back to the business. Um, um here a, another thing i i wanted to ask you is um you've been playing with jeff beck for like three years um and i think this was the most shocking event this year I, I, at least for me and probably a lot of other guitar players because suddenly you realize what is lost for me it was like you know, my hero is gone and uh, there is actually nobody that could replace this guy. And uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't know, what, what, what are your memories? I mean, you toured with him, you record, if, I think you even recorded with him. Uh, are there any, what, what, what happened when, when you heard about the sad news? Uh, I, th I think like a lot of people at first, it's shock because I, I just saw him in September and, you know, it was 20 years ago that I played with him, um, but I I saw him just about every year since then and we'd stay in touch with email. So I lost, you know, a hero and a friend and it's mm. everybody's mourning in different ways. And the way I'm getting through it is just to write everything down and You know, there's a lot of people communicating that haven't communicated for years in, you know, people that are connected to Jeff. 
and somebody will remind me of something I'd forgotten about or didn't even remember in the beginning and and that'll trigger another memory and it just is tentacles reaching out for thousands of pages you know it's just crazy <laughs> but I, I find that helpful and going back and listening to a lot of his music and interviews uh, in fact I just saw something last night that I had never seen before that on the BBC uh, he had played with Pete Townsend doing a couple songs from Quadrophenia and Jeff played the melody ah. and I don't know that I ever saw Jeff in a tux before <laughs> you know <laughs> he was looking super yeah. sharp um, but there's so many gems. He was he left us so much music over the years. Yeah. It, and I remember after the last gig I played with him was at the Royal Festival Hall, <clears throat> which was a kind of a career retrospective. And he sent out thank you cards to everybody. And on mine at the end, he goes, "It's it's rough being idle again." So he's he was always like, "What's next? What's next? What's next?" And whatever was next, he wanted it to be something that didn't happen before. So that's why he was always changing genres and, you know, go from emotion and commotion to playing with bones and just back yeah. and forth and always searching for something new and exciting. And he, he was just an inspiration and will continue to be for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I think one, one aspect that you just brought up is that he was always striving for something new, unexpected. For, he, he always was good for surprise. You never, for me, as just, I met him only very briefly in person once, uh, which was very nice with Narada, uh, Michael Ward, the drummer, and um, um, oh, Linda, I, I don't know, the other guys in the band, they, they were hanging around in, in, in Bonn, and, uh, Bonn, Germany, where, where he played open air. And um, I just had a five minute little talk with him, of course, not about guitars. And I was more uh, talking with Na Narada because, hey, I was actually shy. Me being <laughs> shy in front of him because it's, it's him, you know. But uh, for, for me, as, as being a fan, he, he always had a surprise. Every news that he was presenting on whatever a CD or video or anything was uh, a surprise with fresh energy and so it's good to hear that of course this this comes from his own attitude trying to deliver and being that kind of guy that is fresh all the time and being that kind of guy over decades with you know from from his whatever teens 20s 30s 40s 50s you know that's a lot of respect for my side, you know. It, the other day I was uh, watching some uh, background uh, info about whatever ACDC and Bon Scott, the, the lead singer. So he passed away because he he drank too much and he uh, and he reached his top and there was nothing else to go to. And I think if you are a hero, it's a hard job. <laughs> I don't want to be a hero. You know, people that, that say, oh, you're the Strat King. You are my hero. I say, oh, you know, you know, I just do my thing because it puts so much pressure on you. And yeah. I, I think um, he, deliv he, he always delivered and over delivered <laughs> the, the, the hero prom uh, promise. So uh, impressive, impressive. Yeah, he he was never really interested in fame. It, it was just that's that is the means to an end, and the end was to be able to deliver music and keep bringing up new stuff over the years. And he yeah. he would always say, in fact, that the first it was back in the fax days. He would send me faxes, <laughs> and he he sent me a the first proposed set list. Well, maybe we'll do some of these or some of these, and always there was. And one fuck off rocker, <laughs> you know it's like <laughs> yeah. the mystery tune that might make the tour really happen. That something we yeah. should write or something he hadn't thought of, and it, it was always striving. And we, we listened to a lot of music on the bus. I, mm -hmm. I turned him on to some stuff. He turned me on to some stuff. And a lot of people think that because he started doing electronica when I was in the band, that I was the reason for that. But it's the opposite. He turned me on to the Prodigy. 
And mm-hmm. then I started to listen to all kinds of stuff in that genre, Crystal Method. And he just liked the power of it, the sounds of the drums. And he, he would listen to yeah. everything. I often say he would listen to the Spice Girls and Ornette Coleman back to back. Because he would, it, it's not just the overall listening. It's, there's always little elements that he could use in anything. Yeah, yeah. Totally inspiring. I have a little question if I compare like you versus Jeff. So you have a really uh, profound knowledge of music theory, of scales, of scores. I mean, I think on the highest level, I think you, you've been at GIT and you taught classes and all this stuff. So, and you wrote books. <laughs> uh, and I think Jeff Beck was not writing books on how to play the chords, <laughs> but he did the music. So if we have kind of these two worlds, and I think uh, both of you create beautiful music. So what did you learn from him versus what would you think is important from your background to know? Is there any message from somebody that knows both sides? It's just that everybody is so different. And I, yeah. I can honestly say I never would have got the Michael Jackson gig or the Jeff Beck gig if I hadn't been to GIT. Because that really kicked my ass in so many areas, really got me to know the fretboard. With Jeff, um, he probably couldn't tell you what scale he was playing at any given time, but his ear was so sharp and he really absorbed records early on. He, he would tell me that he... Well, all those guys back then were listening to American radio with the static coming in and out to grab what they could and uh, just really absorbed Muddy Waters and the early American blues. And he was such a natural. I, I love this story because we, <laughs> we, we got into doing raspberries, you know, arm farts, because it was a <laughs> long story, but it happened in a bar and, and yeah. it turned into a contest where we'd see how long somebody could do it without laughing and we'd get out of timer. Stupid road fun. So one day <laughs> he picks up a whoopee cushion that makes the fart noise and he he blows it up and then he starts playing the melody to Cause We Ended His Lovers on it. It's like... <laughs> Complete with vibrato. I mean, who thinks of that? Whoa. And, and another uh, wonderful example is on the You Had It Coming record, there's a song called Blackbird, where it's a call and response to real bird yeah. samples and then Jeff playing on guitar. And I was with him in the studio when he was listening to that, and he looks over and we had just had lunch and there was a spoon on the couch. So he takes the spoon and taps it on the strings And that's on the record. And it sounds exactly like what a bird would do. Like, who thinks of that? Yeah. So I, yeah. I think the, the biggest takeaway from him is listening to everything. Uh, just, you know, a sheer love of music and an, an excitement for it. Um, creativity is number one. Like, when I played with Michael Jackson, it's these are your parts. Every mm -hmm. song is going to be in the same order every night because we have costume changes, dangerous pyro video. I got a little, a little freedom to solo, but like I went from that to 180 degrees the other way, where he wanted to be inspired every night, so he wanted mm -hmm. you to fire him up and maybe do things different every night. So it's God. I, I mean, what a blessed career to have both of those in a, in the same lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think on the other hand, if you are somebody like him, you have to play the role of a hero because if you're not a functional musician, you know, to, to, to put it down on a more average level, of, um, it's like, just imagine <clears throat> the other day I was listening to the Rolling Stones again and I thought, um, I think one of the guitar players, Mick Taylor, did a comment he was wondering how such a bad band could make such great records. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, just have the Rolling Stones cover something else, a Michael Jackson tune, and it would be like, hmm, I'm not sure. You know, um, thriller, rah, rah, you know, with a, uh, I'm sure it would be totally original and maybe a killer version or interpretation, but it would not be, 
a cover, you know, it, it, it would be something unique. So if, if you have certain skills <laughs> and if you're lacking certain skills, you have to compensate with something like that. And this is like how Keith Richards can do it with two chords or maybe three, <laughs> sometimes even more. I'm a big Keith Richards fan. Don't get me wrong, but uh, you know, he has made his thing with his ingredients and um, so for me, in the spectrum, there is a lot of room for everybody. You just have to find your space and you have to, to grow and make this perfect in your own way. I, I think there's a lot of beauty in the innocence of not knowing, of not knowing scales or reading or anything, because then you're forced to 100% go by ear and just put your hands on the guitar and see what sounds good to you. And one thing I I don't do enough, but I would love to do more, and I have done in the past, is to work with a detuned guitar. It's just a whack yeah. tuning, so everything you learn goes out the window, and you're just forced to go, well, what would this shape sound like? And then I'll move this finger. I mean, so Try many to play this way. <laughs> Try to play the yeah. other way around, and you suck. I tried it too. <laughs> But I know what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Sting talked about that too with the police where he he played, um, oh God, uh, Ghost in the Machine, I think it's called, the record. Yeah. He played saxophone because he didn't know how to play it. So yeah. it just brought that innocence of what does this do? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that, that's a quality of its own. But on the other hand, uh, we also have to bring up that to have a deeper understanding of intervals and scales and chords opens up a lot of beauty again you know so this sometimes i'm i'm on the internet and then checking out stuff by other players like you or rick beato and i still don't get it <laughs> or uh, but um, sometimes it's enough if i just practice a little bit and then do my own version of it and use okay. that for, for myself, um, it, it is a good starting point to get me somewhere. You know, I, I, I sometimes don't, don't have the time or the patience. I'm not sure <laughs> if it's the patience or the time, it's, or what's the excuse here, but, um, um, or discipline. Um, but it, it's it's great to 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 look at, at things and 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 start a process. And just for instance, your your book now is um, out in German. Yeah. Yeah. Happy. So. A lot of guitar players in Germany. Yes. So ultra intervallische Gitarrenlicks. Das ist ein deutscher Titel, very German title. 50 intervallische Licks, die deine rock gitarren solo technik transformieren werden. So, this is what it says here in German. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Um, and just by looking at the book, I, I didn't have the time to spend um, really the exercise. But looking at the thing, I get this already put me in a, in a, in, in a mindset. To, to work on this. If I go on a vacation next time, I will spend it. And then, you know, after the vacation, it's full of sand because I take my guitar to the beach and then I will work on your book. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything you want to say about this book here? Yeah, it's, um, that was inspired by one of the teachers at, uh, well, it's now called Musicians Institute. It was just Guitar Institute of Technology when I was there. Uh, there was Ron Eshte, Don Mock, and Joe DiOrio. <clears throat> and before I joined the school, I went to Hollywood for a symposium, and almost everything was over my head, all the theory. I flunked the test to get in, and so I had to study with somebody to, to prep. But Joe DiOrio, um, one of the other guys was super traditional bebop, and Don Mock was the fusion guy, a la Mahavishnu. And Joe DiOrio was started out super traditional bebop, but um, he played with Eddie Harris, a saxophone player. Mm -hmm. And there's a book that Eddie Harris was into that John Coltrane got into that was written by Nicholas Slonimsky, 
the thesaurus of scales and melodic patterns, which sounds super left brain, but um, <laughs> it the ultimate result is playing wide intervallic skips. And, you know, the definition of an interval is the space between two notes. So, you know, half step, whole step, minor third, that's all intervals. But typically when you talk about intervallic playing, it's a fourth degree or higher. And mm-hmm. it's, it's really athletic because most guitar players, when they play, will go from one string to the next, not skipping strings or making mm-hmm. these giant leaps. And uh, during that weekend symposium that I went to, they all played. And I just fell in love with Joe's playing uh, because it was so different sounding. It's very, very unique. And so I got deep into that and start. I memorized a book he put out about intervallics. And I kind of, you know, 20 years later or whatever it was, 30, 40 years later, I, <clears throat> I've been working with it for many years. And so I kind of put out a version for rock with bends and more modern approach. And... The other guy that influenced the hell out of me was a fellow classmate, Steve Lynch, that was in my class. Mm -hmm. And he was in a band called Autograph, and their hit was Turn Up the Radio in the 80s. But he got into tapping, and it was simultaneous Mm -hmm. with Van Halen. So it was a a very different approach. Very, Each one had their own original approach. And just Mm -hmm. stuff that sounds out of the ordinary is really intriguing to me. So the intervallic designs is a culmination of... um, that wacky thinking <laughs> yeah i mean wacky thinking when when we played i, I no 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 uh, the, the, the thing is i noticed that you had also very inspiring sometimes wacky sounding presets wacky in a positive way so, you know like inspiring like um the yaw effect what was it uh, on your digitech um processor what uh, did you use back then yeah well they they called it different names depending on what processor one was called durya or ya ya and no <laughs> other company has come close to what was in the rp series or the gnx series rp yeah, yeah yeah it's i mean to get that vocal sound that you can control with your foot is as close to to a vocal as a guitar player can get i think it's it's closer than a wah wah and why it hasn't progressed into all the other companies, I'll never know. But I'm sad because I don't <laughs> use that anymore. <laughs> so, so, so currently, are you? Uh, what is the the rig you're toying with? Is did you swap to the Line Six Helix or the Watch HX effects or the the smaller one, the Stomp version? What what is is it? What you're you? I started with the Stomp, and when they came out with the XL, it just opened up more for me live so i have the i'm using the four cable method with of course the amp one through the line six stomp x l and hx goes in there somewhere <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then um a mellow audio midi switcher which is i uh-huh. wanted something small and yeah. i take that all in my carry-on and I, I got a super powerful rig, and all I need is a speaker when I land somewhere. Unless, like you told me, that you can take the nano cab in your suitcase. And I, I yeah. did do that once. And I'm planning to do it again. I have a thing I'm supposed to <clears throat> record in April in L.A., and I'm thinking, you know, there's always that variable that you, you just don't know. Yeah. Even if they bring you a Marshall, you never know what shape it's in. Yeah. So I'm I'm yeah. really thinking of taking that again in my suitcase for this because then I know absolutely what sound I'm gonna get. Yeah, yeah. So you know you know the nano cap, the fat cap. You 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 play them both or what whatever. Uh, and the the other thing is I'm of course working on new stuff, a little bit on cabinets as well. But I'm not talking about this yet. On the other hand, the world knows I'm working on this MX thing. The, the good thing, the good news for you one day will be once it's out, we have a processor that has 16 cores and maybe if I'm totally bored, I do that wacky ya-ya sound for you, you know? Uh, and I use you man. as the inspiration for getting sounds that not everybody else has and that you've maybe, you know, used 
to a certain extent on your shows and that would be my dream one day to 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 present you this unit that has everything in one box make making your life easy again so that's one of my personal goals <laughs> for this year and maybe next year to give you some some effect sounds uh, that would make you ha happy but we can talk without the public uh, which are the ones that you really need before the world puts me under pressure like jeff beck being a hero <laughs> I, I will send you on vacation to make that sound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So, hey, anything else on your agenda these days? Um, St. Patrick's Day, is this happening or was this last week? I, I saw a post. Yeah, I followed coming up uh, March 17th in, in Portland. Um, I, for people that don't know, I do a solo multimedia show where I make films and play in sync with just guitar and um i'm adding a bunch of new jeff Beck stuff in fact i'm i'm working on two rivers right now which is one of the ones where he plays the melody with the harmonics and it's woo Whoa, yeah you know i won't do where were you because i think that's absolutely impossible but this one is actually doable but it's, there's just one harmonic that if it doesn't hit right you're it's, I know, I, I know, I know, I know. I tr I tried, I tried that too. So, I have high respect for people that dare to go in that danger zone. Well, it, you know, I always say there's a last time for everything. If if it doesn't go over first time live, it's out. But I'm gonna give it a shot, and I have a beautiful video. Uh, most of the videos are things I find online um, or subscription sites or really old movies. But there's a guy from Scotland that filmed a show. I did years ago that just sent me some beautiful um, nature black and white video of clouds and fog and river and it, it's just just uh, takes you to another zone so i'm excited working on new material cool hey jennifer i think thank you very much for this update today of course there's there will be news we stay in touch and um i hope to see you soon in person again yeah, sounds good. I'll, I'll, thanks okay. for having me. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers. Okay. Cheers. <laughs> yeah, Jennifer Betton. Um, I think the biggest message I took from this interview is the one that I can see also in the chat here, which says, not knowing much about the theory makes me feel fine. I'm free to play what I want and I have an excuse. Ha <laughs> ha. Well, if, if it's good enough for Jeff Beck, it's good enough for me. Um, on the other hand, I think a mixture of knowing a little bit doesn't hurt. Um, for me, the theory is more, don't stress yourself too much about this note is not correct because it belongs to the super Locrian mode, which is the ninth step of a seven note scale. Uh, what was wrong? Then you discuss and then you play the next note. Um, no, I think, um, Intuition and ear comes first and the theory is just good to kind of widen the spectrum to give you inspiration and give you vocabulary so that that's the thing that can help that's something but don't get in the zone where you are over intellectual about your playing at least that's my creed. I see another comment, uh, comment here Guthrie um, Govan on technical exercises is boring. Well, Guthrie, he, he simply played too much. I mean, he is killer. I played with him at the Guitar Summit 2018, I think it was. Unbelievable guy. It's so musical and full of shit. <laughs> I mean, in a positive way. Tons of exciting ideas, rhythmically, uh, scale-wise, you know, monster player but always fresh. So that's, that's what I like about um, players. So the theory doesn't hurt if it doesn't um, hurt, um, get you stuck in this kind of, what is it, the other high, half of the brain. <clears throat> okay, that brings me back to like the beginning of this episode with that little blues song. Usually I'm not a blues guy, um, but last week, I was booked to play the blues anarchy <laughs> and with my rock anarchy. So that's why 
uh, we, we throw in a few a couple of blues songs in the set list and we played some of the songs in the blues style which I like a lot Jump by Van Halen in a shuffle version or Sharp Dress Men <laughs> In case you are a little worried about a different sound, um, that's our next part, listening to different speakers. I have a super simple setup. I play my experimentation change over cabinet, which is the one with the two clamps, and I have a simple SM57 microphone in front of it, and there's nothing else. Um, so it's not the usual blue box direct sound that you just could hear at the intro and at all the other episodes. Um, and actually the mic is not even perfectly um, close to the cabinet because I need the room to change speakers. So <laughs> otherwise the, 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 uh, the mic, I, I will touch the, the microphone and that um, will change more of the tone. So you don't hear any difference. For me, <laughs> La Lagrange, please. Yeah, okay, hey. Uh, um, one day I do the Thomas Blue Blues Band. I see the comments here. Okay, just because of the name. I'm getting famous. Um, but I suck. Anyway. Um, now, let me, let me talk about today's topic. Um, the, the tone is in the cone. Um, you know, from the whole chain that we have, the player, the, the guitar with the strings, the picks, the amp, the speaker is totally underrated in the amount of contribution to the tone. A speaker and a speaker cabinet, because the speaker alone sounds like shit, but in, in a cabinet, the combination of a speaker in a cabinet is defining so much of the sound character of the tone, it is at least 50%. And the amp then fills that room, that frequency range, that character with the amp character. And of course the guitar in combination with the amp creates the other half of the tone, so to speak. But today um, I want to just bring our focus back on the part that most of the time people don't talk enough about it. So in today's world we see so many options how to play the guitar. Some of you guys maybe just play on whatever your home stereo or have a whatever a full range uh, modeler into whatever Hey, it's all good for pra practicing purposes and whenever you have fun, I'm happy for you guys because that's, um, you know, it, a, a guitar tone is, is good when you feel it and it, if it sounds the way that you can connect to it and if, when you can interact with it. For me, the starting point were the good old traditional days where we used to have real big cabinets on stage and now they are shrinking. Um, as I said, I grew up with 4x12s and I downsized over the years because I found, for me personally, it is not necessary to have that wall of sound with, you know, the Ingwie wall of stacks behind you. Um, in, in, in my reality today, that fat cap single 1x12 cabinet I'm using all the time is just perfect. It's just enough. I have a little clip from, from a, a mobile phone video that somebody took from last um, Friday, I, I guess it was Friday Blues Day, um, and just listen to a few bars of that because that's the stage sound. You will hear there's not much on the PA and by the way when you look the sound engineer placed the microphone totally wrong. I didn't 
I gave him the blue box just in case, but we were loud enough on stage, so we, we didn't have much guitar on the PA anyhow. There was the vocals out there and the rest. You can hear uh, it is the sound from that fat cap on stage. Check it out and listen to the difference from the clean to mean. It's about that clean spectrum and of course I build up my solo and then I uh, get into more gain and more gain and more gain and the transition is totally like seamless and for me um, what what is important is I have those silky highs which I want for my clean tone and when I Increase the gain, there is no harshness. So I'm actually, I depend on these extra highs for my tone. It's this kind of silver shimmery, silky high end treble, but um, for that clean range. And then when I increase the gain, it, it needs to be filled up with the mids and the lows in a way that that silkiness is, is not getting harsh. And this is an issue with some speakers. So there are dull speakers and there are bright speakers, but the ones that I prefer are the ones that are, are in my definition kind of even. Of course, I'm totally aware that there are different characters of speakers that you guys prefer for certain things and that's totally fine, but I'm just talking about my approach. So you can double check with your approach and then you can find out whatever works best for you guys. I see a comment here. Do we hear the phone mic or the SM7B? We're referring to that video. This was the phone mic. Um, this was just a, 
a video somebody took sitting in the audience. And um, I think that's a good example of showing what's the reality today. People sitting there with their phones and that's the sound they get. And at the position where this phone was held, it was the stage sound. It was kind of the second row in the audience and the PA was even far out to the left and to the right and this kind of was in the center. So this was our stage sound, basically. And not even the microphone because I, I played the M1 on probably five to six, what I usually do. Um, <clears throat> and um, that's where the, the, the guitar is on top of the band. And um, yeah, this is where I have my sweet spot. I can play lower, but um, it works best with this band and this drummer. Um, anyway, okay. Um, let me show you a little bit of different speakers that I found. Um, um, and maybe you can hear some differences. Um, talking about the setup here, I'm just playing the Les Port or the Strat or whatever into the Vintage channel. And if you see here, the master is set to very, very low. So this is kind of one on amp one. And uh, tone control kind of in the middle, uh, blah, blah, blah. So there's not no magic here. It's just one setting um, I'm using um, kind of as a reference and the speaker cable going straight into my experimental speaker swapping cabinet. So the speaker that is currently uh, in that cabinet is a G1265. That's the speaker that Angus Young uh, ACDC used a lot. To me, it has a special nice mid-range. Um, it is not as shimmery as Greenbacks and other speakers, but I just have this in here and that's the first speaker that we're listening to. Um, let me play something. <laughs> So whatever that is, it's not ideal, but it's a, a you know, a classic setup that everybody could do um, by themselves uh, at home using a Shure SM57 in front of a guitar speaker. Um, let me swap that speaker to a super old, this is a Greenback um, 20 watts. Wait a minute, this is the camera. And this speaker, I think, is from 1966. So this is a G12M, um, a super old one. I swap and we listen. Okay. So, I wonder if you hear a difference, we'll find out. So, what I hear with this speaker is killer high-end, this is like 
my sparkle silver high end is there. And it's not harsh, okay? That's a good reference because that's kind of one of the oldest speakers I have in my collection, uh, Celestion. So I think today is more Celestion Day. Um, point here is I just want to make you aware of the different characters of just the speaker chassis. Mind that I'm not changing anything else. The housing is the same, the microphone is the same, the guitar is the same, just a different speaker. Now let's go for the next incarnation of a greenback, which is another famous greenback, it's the G12M, um, of course, but now with 25 watts. Okay, so the one that we just heard is the 20 watts, that's the one that Eddie Van Halen, Eddie's favorite, and this is kind of Jimi Hendrix's favorite, um, or at least one of those. Um, let me swap it. Let me see if we can hear a difference. Oh. So, surprise, I hope it works. Sounds more rock. I hope you can hear what I can hear here in the room. Um, so this is the famous 25 watts uh, greenback. Again, pre-roller, the real deal. This is kind of some of the best speakers that I ever came across from my speaker collection. I'll show you my speaker collection in a minute. I see a question here. UK made versus China made Celestian. Any experience? Yes, sure. Um, the UK made uh, are generally better. Uh, the building quality actually is better in, from China, but the sound quality is better from the UK. Um, and I only accept the China made V30s, the new one. That's industry standard and somehow they, they managed to get the, the Chinese, Chinese production good. Um, the green bags coming from China I don't like at all. Um, so all I like is greenbacks from the UK, either before they moved the production there or the, the newer reissues, whatever they hand build or expensive stuff. <clears throat> Aha, Helmut says the 25 watt is not my favorite here. Yeah, of course. We all have our favorite speakers and there is the point here is not that I'm saying that's the best. It's just listen to different speakers. And here we go and have the next candidate, which is a made in England, made in England, uh, vintage 30. You know, kind of the industry classic speaker that has been used on so many amplifiers. And you can see it with... You know, last week we had um, the Bad Cat amps there, 
this kind of speaker is in there. UK made speaker. So great all rounder. This one is again old from the 90s, I guess. Let me see how that sounds. It's a bit heavier, so expect a little bit more punch. But let's see. Okay. I'm not sure what you're hearing, but I would say there is that typical throaty mid-range of a vintage 30 that sometimes is too much for me. Yeah, somebody writes here more nasality. Neither. And that's why I'm personally not the biggest fan of the vintage 30, even though it's a great working speaker. With this kind of frequency range, you cut through a band. You know, this extra mids is always a push in the middle that makes the, the guitar cut through. But going back to the greenbacks, I think the greenbacks have more elegance. That's my taste. Um, of course, you, has, you have to uh, adapt your playing style to that as well. And mind, the greenbacks don't have that um, punch as well. So they only have 20 or 25 watts and uh, they are lighter, so they have a, a, a weaker magnet. And the, the, the V30, the Vintage 30, has a stronger magnet, which helps a lot. This kind of speaker is the metal guitar player's favorite and it's a super all-rounder. So there is nothing wrong about that speaker, but you know, I'm just talking about different speakers because all these nuances, they make a difference. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> Me personally, I'm missing that super sparkle, but I would call this a potato quality. It's just like a dish that makes you, okay, I'm not hungry anymore. <laughs> um, and there's also a quality about that. Um, now we can, whatever, listen to a modern speaker. This is a uh, G12H, 75 watts, 16 ohms. Um, I bought this speaker because I thought this is one of the better new speakers. Mind that all the speakers we listened so far are vintage speakers. These are the original old speakers played for decades, played uh, in cabinets and uh, they are kind of um, well broken in and smooth as can be. Um, that's why they ended up in my collection. So this is one of the newer selections, um, G12H, um, supposed to be, you know, high-end with cork rings, that has a special connection to the baffle, which is not having any effect on the way in my easy swap cabinet here at the moment. But, um, you know, small little details. Um, let's have a listen.
Oops. <laughs> so let's see what this sounds like. At least there's some sparkle that I like. Um. There's a little zizzle on top. That's because the speaker is new. The high end is not as silky as the worn in speakers. Um, if this speaker is played for a long time, it gets silkier because uh, it has, to me, the right frequencies. Yeah, Dominic says Creamback sounds like Led Zeppelin. Yeah. <laughs> just heard that speaker. I'm not about um, uh, to making too many comments, but it's just to give you an idea of what's going on in the world of speakers. So, um, oh yes, very heavy speaker. So, and here is another candidate. Um, this is a scumbag. Ah, actually that's a nice one. It's a 65. We could com have compared this to the first one. Um, yeah, let's go for this one. Ouch. How do you like that speaker? Any comments? Uh, I don't see any comments. Where can we buy blue CapX? <laughs> um, I think there's a Captor X, right? No, it's a Cap M. <laughs> they have a product like uh, X, but anyway. Um, quilter cabinets are really good too. I don't know these. Uh, somebody says rocking. Um, yeah, so. This is supposed to be a boutique high-end speaker, uh, which is... It has this airiness, okay? Then I have this one here. Oh, that's an Alnico speaker. Um, this is supposed to be one that um, David Gilmour used and from what I remember it has a certain special mid-range. Let's listen to that.
come on. I don't get it in there. <coughs> Leave it like it. Wait a minute. It's supposed to be 12 inch, guys. What's, what's wrong here? <coughs> I have no idea. It's too big anyway. We just, we have a quick go. I hope it doesn't fall apart, but a few, the famous last words. <laughs> to me, there is a mid-range thing which you might like or hate, I don't know. The sparkle is not and like it, but anyway, um, it faints out. <laughs> hey, that's a good one. Um, okay, and here I have one of our speakers as well, which is the classic, which comes from the Nano Cap. Um, let's listen to that speaker. Shit. Oh, this way it works, okay. So let's listen to that speaker in that cabinet. Hey, there's my sparkle. What about that? Sparkle, remember, green bags were the king of sparkle to me. I'm talking about the good green bags, the real UK made green bags from the 60s and 70s. Because the green bags from China, they don't have the sparkle. And there's my sparkle. So that's the way I like to voice my speakers. And here comes the next element to deal with the high end. And mind that this speaker is not broken in. This is kind of a brand new speaker um, that hasn't been played. Um, so the next part that is important is the grill cloth, which is actually like the one for my good old Marshall cabinet made out of paper. Do we have a lighter here? We have no lighter here, no smokers. Um, because when you light this up, you can smell the paper and it's like, ah, this is the real deal. And if you go for plastic, it will stink. So anyway, um, I'm putting now the grill cloth in front of that speaker. And maybe you can hear a difference. So um, To me, it's a filter that... the shimmer high end and just enough and not too much. Okay, 
So that's the speaker that I designed for our nano cap. And then, um, of course, for any cabinet that we have in, in, in the range, I have a special made speaker because even if that would be a great speaker now, if you put this into the fat cap, um, you know, then it sounds great, no problem, but um, it sounds better to my ears if I max out the speaker specifically for that housing, for that um, fat cap. So, um, you know, the nano cap and the fat cap, um, fat cap, I think we have a fat cap in the room. I get a fat cap here. Yoohoo! Yeah! So, fat cap. Um, th this has a portation um, to get like extra low end out of this 112. And then when, when you have that kind of uh, bass resonance thing um, that simulates the 4x12 sound, um, I want more chuck and more rock chuck. And therefore, I change that speaker uh, to a speaker with a heavier magnet. So this is 38 ounce magnet and the fat cap speaker is 42 ounce magnet. And then you make a sample, then you listen to the sample and then you think, ah, oh, you know, maybe we should change a little bit of the highs towards another direction um, because it sits in here, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, and so I go through different versions of a speaker uh, to make each cabinet sound like I want it to sound, to max out the sound of each cabinet. But I'm totally aware that there are some other cabinets from other manufacturers out there that are great as well. And um, I just try to offer some cabinets that are not standard. And of course they um, sound great with the Blue Guitar products because, you know, a great match. And not to forget about our speaker cable, but that's another story. But back to the cabinets. Um, it is like the nano cab is so small, there is no other cabinet with such a compact size. And also the weight, I think eight kilograms, under 10 kilograms, um, that's, that's definitely uh, something super portable. It even fits into a big suitcase for the guys that have to travel. It's enough room in your suitcase to put an M1 on top and a few clothes, a few socks and uh, underwear, and the rest is not needed, uh, in my case. Um, yeah, you can even get a strat if you detach the neck, fits in there as well. So I've, I've I traveled like that um, with a big um, suitcase. Yeah, and. On the, on the nano cap, there's also the, the option to have um, that little plate on the back, remove that. And the base portation that is like the cut out um, edges with that little tunnel uh, to, to get, give you more low end from this little um, 112 cabinet uh, will give you a certain kind of base, which is rather big for such a small uh, cabinet. But if you open that plate on the back, um, the resonance frequency changes and you get more kind of an open back sound, which is a slightly lower resonance and um, a, a slightly different mid-range. So that's the options with this one. Fat cap, it's to me a classic if you come from the good British rock tone uh, it does the job. And even people like Alex Bayrod, you know, coming from the wall of sound with Marshall on big festival stages, he, he plays fat caps these days as well and is, is totally happy. It took a while until a rock star that is used to a wall of sound um, getting used to have less behind him. <laughs> but who cares? The, the moment... You have to carry the cabinets yourself. You will love 
the cabinets that we, we offer. And then there is um, the twin cab, which we actually have in this corner, but <laughs> forget it. Um, we use this as a stand for um, the camera sometimes. Um, um, the, the twin cab is, is the 212 cabinet um, that can go vertical and horizontal. And this cabinet um, with two 12 inch speakers has more headroom simply because of having two speakers, 150 watts, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, so I think that's what's important on, um, on speaker for you guys that you know your speaker. And there are so many different options for you guys. All I'm saying is if you are totally happy with what you've got, st stick with it, stay there. Uh, because if that's your tone, fine. If you're still on the hunt for something more practical, well, there are options and we have a few options here. And uh, in my philosophy, smaller is sometimes better. It's definitely better when you travel. Um, and it is sometimes even better on stage because if you have a speaker on stage that is not so fucking loud, like a 4x12, um, you can have that single 112 in, in the sweet spot zone where the speaker kind of starts to compress a touch, where it's, you know, um, not cold. What, all what we heard right now was kind of master on one. So it actually gets better the louder I play it if you go to stage volume. But this is my perspective on things coming from a perspective of a player that plays with the real drum kit and not with in-ears. I'm totally aware that there are silent stages these days. I was using in-ears myself on the super big stages because um, the, the latency when I was on the super big stage from my cabinet to my ear was simply too much. So I was losing time. Therefore I was using in-ear, but I still had a speaker on the stage because uh, nobody did mind and the drums and the bass uh, amp and, and, and monitors were just there. But on top of that, we had the in-ears to get, uh, you know, the, the big stage under control in the timing to reduce the latency. Um, but in my current reality, playing clubs and little outdoor street fests, a single 12 does the job for me. And one thing to mention is, if you put the cabinet on the floor, you have the most bass, which is great for a rock guitar player. If you are more a blues guy, you can also, you have, a few more options. You can also have this cabinet this way um, or uh, the other, instead of having it horizontal, you can have it sideways, but you could also angle it a little bit. And there's this great tool by Huvi, the D-Flex, um, which I believe is especially great for tall people um, because the D-Flex spreads the sound evenly like in a cylindric kind of wave and projects this also high. So if you are close to the cabinet, the signal is directed to your ears and you have a balanced sound close to the cabinet and even a little bit further uh, from the cabinet. I prefer that to this, um, um, what do they call it? The the, the plexiglass walls that they put in front of amps to reduce the volume. You know, when you go to a Joe Bonamassa concert, you see a pile of amps and ton, tons of plexiglass in front of it. So it's not getting too loud and too much in your face. The deflex actually turns that noise into your direction and, and blocks the noise from the first guys in, in uh, in the first row. 
So that's that that's something um, uh, I would recommend instead of having these plexiglass walls. Um, I'm using the deflex sometimes and it, sometimes I don't need it because when I have the right distance to my cabinet and the right angle, which you should experiment with, where do you place your cabinet? Is it just behind you, old school style? Then you will hit the first raw with the beam of the speakers. But if you place it like a little bit on the side and turn it inwards to the stage, it's a more even sound on stage and you don't hurt the first uh, listeners in the first row so much. Um, there's a lot of um, sound improvements you can get just by placing the cabinet right. So, any questions here? Um, your experimental camera is still sitting on a bar chair. How will it sound being placed on the floor? Well, it, so it would sound a lot better on the floor because then I have a lot more bass. I just, you know, had this lousy setup here with just a simple SM57. Uh, so we, 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 we get some, some sound. Uh, and you wouldn't see it if it would, was on the floor. So therefore I just put it uh, on a stool and there it sits. But you are right, if I would put it on the floor, it would sound even better. Um, it would have the nicer low end and a natural low end. It's not a boomy, weird thing, but um, it would balance out the tones even more. And that's my style. If I have that shimmery high end, the, the right kind of mids that are not too honky, um, but you know, kind of closed mids, so the sound is not scooped. Uh, and then that kind of warm, um, sturdy bass, that's my ideal of sound. And um, in the comparison situation we had here, I, I was not, uh, it was not perfect. I would, was just about to show you some different speaker chassis. Okay, other question here. Uh, somebody wants to sell the Deflex Aura H1. Helmut, here, Helmut is a regular uh, Academy of Tone candidate. Um, yeah, just get in touch with Helmut if you want one of those. Um, what's the speaker in your Princeton? In my Princeton, where's my Princeton? Uh, today it's covered behind this little new toy which is something I'm working on. Um, I think it's the original um, Jensen um, from the early, I think the, the Princeton, my Princeton is kind of early 70s and it's the original speaker. Don't ask me correctly, it's the one that was originally in the amp and it sounded always sounded good. I used it in the studio and it's Silver 112 in the blue box. Maybe I can double check and tell you exactly which one it is when I have more time. I, I'm not ripping the whole display apart right now. <laughs> uh, but it's the original speaker from a Fender Princeton Silver Face, early 70s, 73, 72, something like that. Um, so, uh, what's the speaker in your Princeton? Okay, uh, Helmut, uh, hey Thomas, have you ever got in touch with ears with uh, integrated ambient mics? Yeah, um, yeah, there's things going on. I had, uh, one, what, what was it? Um, there was a 3D kind of thing that I was checking out and it's getting a lot better than it was in the early days. So the in-ear thing is a topic um, that we can see a lot of progress. Um, but I'm still happy to wear nothing in my ears, to be honest. I don't have cotton in my ears like Uli John Roth because he plays so loud. I don't, I just go on stage and if the drummer is too loud, if it's 
too close to the cymbal. Sometimes I, I wear earplugs in just this one ear or I go to the toilet and make it a little bit wet and have a little bit of toilet paper so I'm not totally deaf the next morning. But I, I, I still love the old school rock and roll. Here's my amp, here's the drum kit and here's rock and roll. That's how I grew up and that's how it feels right for me. I'm not saying that you know in ears don't feel you get you have to get used to it and you have to work on things like the ambient mics because the the in ears kind of detach you from reality and then if you don't hear anything what's going on ambient wise it's kind of you're isolated and that's not good for my style of music when i play on stage i communicate with all my you know musician friends on stage and i need to listen to that and uh it's good to to see and hear in the organic way for me so i can spot all these little nuances i i can go closer and then that changes the, what i hear because when i move myself and go towards the drums i hear differently than standing two or three meters uh, far far away from the drums and the same so that the, so I can mix I can do my own mix just by moving on stage sometimes I move to the center sometimes I move to the bass player singer sometimes I go to the drums and sometimes I stay where I'm usually standing um, but that's just my way um, okay the Jensen Tornado yeah um, Jensen Tornado is a neodymium speaker. That's a whole nother topic because neodymium speakers are super lightweight and they used to be not so good, but they're getting better. And actually I'm working on something like that myself as well. And um, it's not finished, but you know, I torture my speaker manufacturers for better samples and better samples and Maybe we try this and we change that. And um, But I have to admit the Jensen Tornado is one of those better ones. Um, okay. Do you have a Boss Vasa speaker to change into your experimental cap? No. Um, unfortunately not. Um, uh, which one affects more? The wood type? or the caps construction or the speaker are more noticeable. Um, I'm in love with your work since H and K. Ah, okay, yeah, well, that's ages. Um, so what is more effect, uh, what does affect the tone more? Is it the wood, the construction or the speaker? Hey guys, it's everything. Um, to put it in percentage, I would say the construction, which means the, the design of the housing, the resonance inside the box, because when you have a box like this, you have a sound like that, and if you have a box like that, you have a different resonance. So if you change the size of the cabinet and the dimension and the distance of like the front baffle and the rear and and that has a huge, this, this is a, a, a very, very big, big, big factor. And as we could hear earlier, the speaker also brings a certain character with it. So that's again important. And then the wood type, I would say, comes on top because I heard cabinets made out of MDF, which is this kind of processed wood with kind of glue and, you know, the leftovers of wood, which is like very heavy and very dense. And it sounds totally shit, in my opinion, for guitar cabinets, but it sounds totally cool for studio monitors. Why? Because it doesn't resonate. It's kind of a very heavy and almost dead material that doesn't bring any resonance to, to the party, to the sound. And I personally like cabinets 
that are controlled um, in the way that they don't get fluffy. For instance, on the twin cap, I had the issue that um, I used thinner wood to save some weight because weight for me, handling is very important. And if you have a two by 12 with two speakers and heavy, thick MDF wouldn't work at all. It's like 40 kilograms, uh, no fun. But so I was using um, multiply wood and then I reduced the thickness of the wood. And then at a certain point, the wood became, um, um, started almost rattling in a way because there was too much vibration and to have like a brace from the front to the rear in the middle with not just one point with a little bit more was fixing it perfectly and that tightened up the base and still had some mids resonating in the wood so the cabinet actually resonates a little bit like an acoustic guitar at certain frequencies but I could get rid of that low um, uncontrolled uh, resonance in that cabinet. So what I'm trying to say is the wood of course has an influence if you have multiply wood or the MDF which I don't like um, the, the, the weight of the wood, the density of the wood has an effect Back in the Hughes and Kettner days, <laughs> there was poplar wood cabinets, ultralight. We called it in German Erdbeereiche <laughs> for the Germans. Um, I'm not a hundred percent fan of that wood, but it was the thing to get a lightweight cabinet back in the days. And it's still pretty good. And by the way, the, these cabinets are using vintage 30s, like the one that I just showed you. Um, from the good old days. So buy the cabinet, get the speaker and put it somewhere else if you are into vintage 30s. It's always um, a good buy. But um, the resonance uh, um, on that cabinet is okay, but if it would have been used a, a heavier wood, it would sound a little bit better. So there was the trade-off back in the days this was an experiment on how light cabinets can be built and it is okay. I mean, it's, I, I heard worse cabinets. <clears throat> Sorry. So what other questions do we have? I am uh, very interesting. Uh, Motai, they use a 10 inch. 10 inch speaker, um, just because it occurs here. Um, to me, they are special speakers. You know, when you look at my Super Reverb, there is 10-inch speaker. Um, in general, I'm not the biggest fan of 10-inch speaker because I'm more the rock guy. And out of a 10-inch, usually I don't get the real rock and roll ACDC low end. I get something out of, of, it, of it. Sometimes they sound great, but they are more blue speakers to my ears. That's a generalization. Um, I have a few tens in my collection, but there is usually I'm a ten, a twelve inch guy, and it always made me happy my whole entire life. Um, what I have in ears is tinnitus. Okay, tinnitus, tinnitus in English. I don't know tinnitus in German. Uh, well, that's that's that noise that never stops if you are Pete Townsend or another rock and roller you probably have that disease um, 8 or 16 ohm speakers well let's put it that way 16 ohm speakers have um, more windings and therefore a, a slightly different uh, impedance um, even if the manufacturer tries to get the same like vintage 30 in 8 ohms they don't sound exactly the same even if they try to it's kind of physics there is a little bit more different wire on the core on the coil and um, I would 
generally say a 16 ohm speaker sounds a bit warmer, a bit more mid rangey and not as so. But 8 ohms, if it's done right, you know, it's I, I kind of it is it is the whole mixture here. Our blue guitar speakers usually have eight ohms and the eight ohms with our design I preferred because there is kind of this nice shimmering effect and all that stuff. You know, if you know your ingredients, you can cook the, the sound uh, to your taste and that's what I've done. And um, yeah, so to say any 8 ohm speaker is shit or any 16 ohm speaker is shit is, is, is wrong. Okay, um, the, 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 what is your opinion on, opinion on stuffing cabinets versus empty? Um, I would say it depends on the cabinet construction. For instance, in a nano cab, there is filling, there is a stuffing uh, material. The theory says that if you put that kind of stuff in the cabinet, it makes the weird effect of making it bigger in a way. So um, that was, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just open to anything and I experiment with, with anything there is. And so I have that filling or stuffing around and I put it in cabinets and see what happens. For instance, on the fat cab, the rear panel is covered with that because it kind of kills some unwanted resonance frequency in that housing. Um, I tried of course to fill the whole cabinet and uh, with the walls, without the walls and then I came to the point I like it best when it's only that rear wall. In the nano cab there's a little bit more and I like it best like it is there. And here's a little hint. That filling stuff in the nano cap is even black. And it's black because when you take off that black cover on the back, you don't want to see a black cabinet with a white thing in the in a hole. So if you take off the cabinet back panel, you look into a black hole. And that's look looking great. And the other thing you have seen before is the blue guitar speakers are actually blue and nobody sees it. Well, we pay I think one or two dollars extra for that cool blue and nobody sees it. Well, I kind of stole the idea from Apple. They signed their early computers and nobody saw that either. And this is the way how to waste money. <laughs> no, it's that little detail that I liked. Um, anyway. Um, so, more questions. I, I like that. Um, the Vox-like planks change tone surprisingly. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, anything you do changes tone. Uh, okay, next time you please poke holes into the cone like Link Ray to get the rumble sound. Brang, brang, brang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom, boom, boom. Um, no, I have done the can the guitar, can my strat sink or swim? So, okay, next time we come to another destruction series. I got some bad comments for that one already, but anyway. Um, my favorite speaker is the G12H25 from 1967. What is your favorite? My favorite... My favorite... Talking about vintage original speakers is probably... I'm torn between the, 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 the Greenback 25 and 20. So that's... And, and I have another speaker that I pulled out of a very old Marshall PA cabinet. It just says Marshall on it. 
and I don't even know what speaker that is. That could be one of those G12 H25s, but I, I think it's it's probably a 30 watt speaker. I don't know exactly what it is, but that's another great uh, speaker. And here comes my, I'm a vintage guy. Uh, somehow the older, the better. Um, yeah. Um, but for practical reasons, I'm not playing my 1966 Greenback on stage because it only has 20 watt and that's not enough for rock anarchy. The anarchy would kill it. The rock will be fine, but the anarchy does kill it. So uh, therefore I play my blue guitar speakers all the time. But from all the speakers, the blue guitar speakers to me are a very good compromise having all these aspects that I like and they actually work on stage and produce that volume that I need. Um, and the other speakers that I have in my collections are great sound references. Um, okay, what would blue guitar speakers? Um, the blue guitar speakers are available only as a replacement. Uh, we don't sell them really. If there's only one guy in the world, we can make the exception of that rule. Uh, <clears throat> and we have to calculate a very expensive price. But uh, anyway, um, if, if, if you can't sleep anymore, write us an email. Um, ah, Paul Schlachter, very good question. Opinions on front versus back mounted speakers. Yes, the front mounted, like in my experimental cabinet, um, they have a different high end again. And the back mounted speakers, they, they kind of um, focus a bit more mids like that. And, and this fizziness is less because there is some high end created on the surrounding of the speaker here. And when this is kind of in a, not very steep, but that little tunnel around that um, cone, it reduces that extra highs a little bit. So as we could probably hear, this speaker has that too much high end. But having this rear mounted does help. Having a grill cloth with a filter effect like the good old Marshall cabinets did have um, does help. And to back it up with a nice fat sounding housing with the right resonance for a speaker does help as well. And that's giving me the perfect mixture for that uh, speaker. And by the way, this speaker here doesn't use edge treatment. Um, and I like that because it sounds more open and it sounds very alive even at the very lowest volume, which is sometimes a problem with certain speakers because they come alive only when you crank them. But this speaker is very even at low and up to the maximum volume of the speaker. Man, how many questions do we have? Uh, <laughs> I continue to play my silver with a nano cap. Maybe we'll try a fat cap soon. Yeah, try it out. The, the fat cap is rocky. The nano cap is... Ah, try it out. I think the, I'm the fan of the fat cap, but I, I like my nano cap as well. But the fat cap is my cup, cup of tea. Um, Oli P, you also raised the prices due inflation. Do you think you can keep the prices for MX at 2K? Yes, we can. Who said that? I said. Okay. Does Celestian Greenback sound better with a Fender Jaguar headstock penetrating it? <laughs> I, you know, I can smash my gold top and ruin a couple of thousand in a minute here. It's not, it's not a big deal. I can do good old Richie and smash the camera you know, like uh, the California Jam. Well, it wasn't, not, it wasn't only the camera, it was also the fine he had to pay. But I'm not a real rock star, so I don't do that. Um, broken isn't broken. 
yeah, well, it's all kind of sound. We can use anything. Um, it's modern speakers that sound close to vintage. Quam Nichols 12 inch Alnico. Oh, I'm not totally aware of that speaker, but Alnico speaker is, um, of course, the very old speakers, they used Alnico magnets. The Alnico magnet was kind of the first generation that we could see, or the first generation of speakers used Alnico mag magnets. And by the way, this is in the blue box, the stack 1965. These were the Celestian Greenbacks, 15 watts. One speaker has only 15 watts. And these Celestians um, were Alnico speakers. The next generation is the 20 watt and the next is the 25 watt and then 30 and so on. So it's all in the blue box. Um, Alnico speaker. I had one put in my Marshall Code 50 and it sounded great. Yeah, compared to the codes. Or Alnico speakers, they have that beautiful high end. They have that silver sparkle that I'm always looking for. So basically, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Alnico because they have this kind of mm, smooth, uh, delicious brightness, not harsh. Um, sometimes they, they are lack, lacking a little bit of that mean uh, side, but if they, you know, like the Code 50, maybe the amp brings that and then you get a balanced tone with that as well. Um, please consider making profiles of your amps for Tonex. Um, <laughs> yeah, Fabian Ratzak has, has a Tonex, uh, uh, IK Multimedia, and he probably does make some sounds for you guys for that product. Why not? Um, but we will do the AppX and I make profiles of all the stuff that I like, including, you know, those speakers. Um, in the right cabinets, but this is um, it has a lot of things to do. Um, Hardy O, I saw the blue color when I bought my fat cap and opened the back. Had to smile because of your attention to details. Yeah, okay. Um, when Blue Guitar X will be available, we had a release day which is officially the 25th of July. For the first ones to be seen. What is the story with the Blue Box Tech 65 speaker? Ah, to be honest, it's a super great cabinet. And that's the only cabinet that I personally don't own in the Blue Box. But I'm good friends with the owner. And that Alnico loaded Marshall cabinet is fucking expensive. And this guy is a collector who's got the money. And he simply has a big house and he has the funds and he bought it and he let me do the sound for the blue box with it. And we're still friends. Um, that's the story. Uh, Celestian V75 is a midless acute. Ah, okay, talking about the 75s. The 75 is a. It's a great speaker with the right amp. It went well with some uh, 800s. Um, I'm not, it's, it's not the be best all-rounder to my taste, but it's, it's another classic with a certain, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm missing something as a universal kind of speaker. You know, the, the speakers that I like are great speakers for clean, blues, rock, and metal for everything. Uh, and some certain speakers, they have a character that defines a certain direction and that limits it to like more a certain genre or that makes it more special in that direction but less all round in another way. So it's always a trade-off and therefore not bad but something special. V30 or Greenback? I'm Greenback. Simple answer. You know my... And just 
go back in this episode, listen to the greenbacks. Even with a super lousy, what I heard in the room is, like, ah, man, I know where the sound comes from. The older, the better. Vintage greenbacks. Um, ever try barefoot face guitar? Cap? Yeah, uh, barefaced. Uh, I think uh, I once plucked one, in, in, but I'm I'm not sure anymore. Um, Kamla, I also know they are massive and they are they are they are uh, uh, very very um, sturdy and very controlled. In my personal opinion, a little bit too stiff. But hey, here is the thing, you know, I like the, the Kamla is a fantastic cabinet, but for me, too controlled, too, too stiff. It's like a pair of jeans too tight for me. <laughs> um, but brilliantly engineered. The, no, the guy knows what he's doing. Um, does anybody know a speaker? It's actually used in Harley Benton. Oh, I don't know. Uh, Riviera is not hype in today trend. Riviera used to be very. Uh, Paul Riviera was the king when he modded Fender amps and he created the Fender Super Champ, an amp that I bought in 1986, probably when it came out, with a super special tube that has three systems. Um, and but these days. Riviera is a specialty for that era of tone and I think time moved on. I'm not saying it's bad, it's just a thing that had its place in the past. Um, can still be great. It's not so hyped these days. String theory. Hey Thomas, which are good 10 inch speakers for 74 Fender Super Reverb in your opinion? Um, Fuck, there is a guy who was visiting me um, with a 64 Super Reverb, just like mine. Mine has the original speaker and he had Eminence replacements. Um, uh, where's my phone? Um, What's the name of the, the, the Saarland Blues player? Uh, young guy. Good voice, good singer, super reverb. Hey, Saarland people, do we have any... Uh, fuck, he was here. Uh, he was not on the Academy of Tone, but he was in this room. Man. Uh, Lukas uh, Schüssler. Is it Schüssler? Yeah, Lukas Schüssler. Uh, and what's the name of his band? Luke, Luke, yeah, like Luke, but Luke, L-U-K-E. If you write this guy an email, I heard his cabinet and these were really, really good replacement speakers versus the all original Holy Grail 1964 Fender Blackface original speakers. Uh, write him an email. Lukas Schüssler on Luke. Uh, the blues band. Maybe we can put the, the website in here. Greetings from Thomas. <laughs> so, um, da, 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 I play my Princeton Reverb to Rivera. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, Rivera modded those Fender amps uh, for, for more game, Santana style. Hey, it's, it's great stuff. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think we have ah we have a little video about my speaker collection. Just uh, let me show you this one uh, before we have done it. Fun. You have to see my next room. There's even tons more speakers that I did, even didn't bring in here. Just watch that little clip of more speakers. So here's a part of my speaker collection. Um, of course. UK made vintage 30s, 8 ohms. This is a 70s G12 H55 Hertz from the base cabinet. Two greenbacks, 8 ohm UK made, greenback 20 watts, which is a 1966 original greenback. That's another one. Um, so here we have some newer speakers, which are creambacks, 75 watts, 16 Hertz. 
BG means blue guitar, there are some blue guitar speakers. This is a G12, um, well, yeah, uh, what is it, um, H roller, I, I don't know. Warehouse, guitar speaker, <laughs> the legend, here we have more. And G12 T60, uh, a more affordable speaker. These are blue guitar speakers. Here we see two, um, must be end 60s, early 70s, um, Celestians from a Marshall PA cabinet. Fantastic speakers. I don't know what model. It says Marshall on the back. And here we have original, <laughs> original package, never opened, new old stock. Um, I think these are black bags. Um, what's in here? There is a Joss Smith signature speaker by Eminence. Um, some, some more samples here. Uh, anything exciting here? What is this? Another green bag, UK made. Um, vintage 30s, more new speakers, green bag. And what is this? Pre roller green bag with an exclamation mark. So this must be something really good. And these are ah, the roller. Um, G1275 R means rock. <laughs> um, they all come from one 412 cabinet that I liked so much, and they all sound a little bit different. And this I marked as rock, so the perfect rock speaker. I have the other one marked with whatever uh, blues, probably. Yeah, let's have a listen. Yeah, so you could see there's even more speakers in next room in my little cave, uh, speaker cave. And uh, of course there's, you know, all these cabinets here are loaded too with, with GBL. This this is the aluminum dust cap um, GBLs for the twin reverb and, you know, all these Fender amps, my Vox and my um, 1957 uh, Tweet Deluxe and whatnot. And this beautiful cabinet that's coming eventually. Uh, hey, and by the way, I did the whole episode only because we have the speakers back uh, in stock. We have, we haven't, we, we were sold out for a while. And uh, so this, of course, came up the idea, ah, what's going on with speakers? We have speakers, I can talk about it again. <laughs> um, yeah, just as uh, that little info here. Um, so this episode for me was tone is in the cone, which means consider what the speaker is doing as a contribution to your tone. And if it's perfect for you or if you want to experiment and, and, and enhance your tone in a way by changing things. It's always trying to find things to make things better and uh, experiment with it. So um, I hope you have learned a little bit more about that. And next time you listen to speakers from a different perspective. Um, next week, I think, I think it's tone is in your hands. Ha! Uh, tone is not in your amp. Never. No. Tone is of course in your amp, but I'm shedding light on each of the individual part of the signal path of the chain. And um, if I'm correct, next week Manuel Kettenring is coming and he came with, ah, you know, it's so important. I can, I can see so many people having not the right tone because they don't have the right approach. And I totally get it because we all know guys that have a tone. You know, there are some guys that just play one note and that note is full of tone. And then there's guys where you think, yeah, actually great player, but something about the tone could be improved. And it can be the gear, but it can also be the playing and then, of course, it's kind of matching the playing with the gear. So how to get 
the right amount of gain, how to get this maxed out. It's kind of like a Formula One driver. The car is very important, but the driver is also very important. So if you have a Formula One car, you won't make the race because you are either the last one if you're not a good driver or but in combination so how to work with the gear with the guitar with the amp is very important and that's what we want to try to uh, investigate a little bit more next week with Manuel um, yeah I Wish you some nice experiments with speakers, amp settings, and cones. You can slaughter your cones at home now. <laughs> um, we do have replacement speakers for Blue Guitar products as well, in case you want to kill your nano cap or whatever. Um, so we don't leave you alone. And even if you manage to cut your grill cloth, we have repair kits ready for you. And if you want a new cabinet, that's also available. So guys, um, thanks for watching. Cheers. And there's some other cabinet videos that I've done in the past. Just go on YouTube, watch it for me. Um, or you know what? I say bye bye and we play you one of the clips. There are three. Which one shall we show? The, let's, let's, let's listen to... Whatever. Lucas can decide. Yeah, it's always hard to make choices, huh? Scheiße. Okay, have a good one. Bye, guys. See you next week. Hi, I'm Thomas Blug and I'd like to introduce the Blue Guitar Cabinet family. There is the Nano Cap, the smallest 1x12 cabinet there is. And there's a lot of 4x12 tone in the Fat Cap, which is a teal small design housing, especially to get this 4x12 tone. And the brand new Twin Cap. The Twin Cap is 75 centimeters wide enough to put any classic 100 watt tube amp on top of it. The twin cap can also be used in two directions, vertical or horizontal. If it's horizontal and the two speakers connect to the floor, we have more low end. If it's vertical, you have more mids. So it's a nice cabinet for many different applications. Every cabinet uses a special design speaker. My blue guitar speakers have lightweight membranes so the membrane sounds very alive and different magnets. There's a 42 ounce magnet for the fat cap, which is this one. And there's a 38 ounce magnet in the nano cap. The bigger magnet gives me more control over the low end, which makes sense for the 4x12 sound in the fat cap. The speaker for the twin cap has 75 watts. It's again a fat magnet and has this typical sound. The connecting plates on the rear offer an input and for the nano cap and fat cap, serial and parallel outputs to combine the speaker with other speakers. The twin cap has a mono input or two separate inputs for stereo use.